Hello everyone and happy Travel Talk Tuesday. Thank you for joining us today. We will begin in just a few minutes. We're just waiting for everyone to log on and let everyone get situated. Please feel free to write in the chat box where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear from you. And hello and ciao to everyone joining us on Facebook today. Please write in the comment section there where you're joining us from. All right, uh, we have Marianne from North Carolina. Hello, Myra from Calgary. Thank you for joining us. We have Crystal from Georgia, hello, and John from Colorado. Hi, John, it's so nice to see you, hello. Um, Barbara from Richmond, Yvonne from Cape Cod. Oh, that's close to where I am, hi. We have Susan from New York City, hello, Susan. Hi, Eldora nice to see you. Eldora is joining us from Florida today. We have Judy from Texas and Julie from Colorado. Oh, there's so many of you today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We have Karen from Tucson and Barb Lockhart from Edmonton. Hi, Barbara. All right. All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Daniela, and I oversee our community and engagement team here at EF Go Ahead Tours. I work out of the Boston office and I'm so excited to be with you here today. It is, it, if this is your first time joining us for a travel talk, welcome. We're so happy to have you. And if you're a returning guest, welcome back. Today is going to be a lot of fun, but before we get started, I want to set some expectations for this session. First, this is a webinar, which means you will only be able to see me and our special guests today. Your camera and microphone will be turned off, so we won't be able to see or hear you. But of course, we want to hear from you. So continue using that chat box and that Q&A box. If you have any questions, just submit them throughout the, the session today. We will have a live Q&A session at the end of this presentation, and we're going to try to get as many uh, questions as possible. We also had a number of questions that were pre-submitted prior to this webinar, and we've used some of those questions to prepare the presentation for today, and we will be answering some of those questions throughout the session today. Okay, so today we're talking about one of my favorite countries in the world, Italy. Located in Southern Europe, this boot-shaped country is one of the world's most popular travel destinations for a number of reasons, including art treasures, trendy fashion, stunning landscapes, passionate people, and of course, top class cuisine. Italy offers so much to see and do that it would take a lifetime to explore. While every part of Italy is unique and worth exploring, today we're going to highlight our top 10 list of the best places to visit in Italy. Over the next hour, we will be virtually traveling from north to south with our expert tour director, Linda. She's going to share her must-see sites you cannot miss on your next trip to Italy. And she's also going to touch on some of the best foods and drinks you should try while visiting there. At the end, we're also going to share a few of our itineraries and ways you can travel to Italy 
with EF Go Ahead Tours. But without further ado, let's meet our special Italian guest and tour director extraordinaire, Linda. Linda, thank you so much for being here today. We're so excited um, for you to take us on this virtual journey through Italy. But before we get started, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience today? Absolutely. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you for having me and welcome everybody. I'm so happy to be here and talk about all things Italy. My name is Linda and I am a Southern Italian originally, although I do live in Rome. So that's where I am right now in my living room in Rome. I've been working for EF Go Ahead for quite a long time and I do enjoy it every day and every day more. My favorite tours are food and wine tours and all the active tours. But what I like about uh, this job is the number of activities uh, that you can actually do the number of tours that we do offer that I do find fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you, Linda, again so much for being here today. Now, before we share our top 10 places to see in Italy, let's first talk a little bit about Italy's geography. Italy is a relatively small country lo located in Southern Europe. And as I mentioned, there is so much to see and Italy has so much to offer and it's no wonder that Italy is one of the top travel destinations out there. So Linda, can you tell us a little bit more? Yes, definitely. From this map, you can see that Italy, as you said, has the shape of a boot. It is a bridge over the Mediterranean Sea with an amazing climate. Uh, it is the second, the 72nd largest country in the world. It is separated uh, from the rest of Central and Northern Europe from the, by, by the Alps. And 40% uh, of the territory is actually made of mountains. And that is the reason why we have such a diversity in scenery as well as in climate. Uh, uh, the population of Italy is nearly 60 million people. So that's why in, we, are, we might be small in size, but we definitely are very populated. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again, Linda. Okay, everyone, let's buckle up our seat belts. We are getting on our virtual go-ahead airplane and are virtually traveling to Italy to visit 10 iconic places. So we're going to start in the north of the country. And the first place we are visiting in Italy is Milan. Now, when I think of Milan, I think of soccer, high-end fashion and fancy designer shops, but I know there's so much more to Milan than that. Linda, tell us why Milan made our top 10 list today and why our audience should plan a trip there. Well, Daniela, you're right. Everybody who thinks about Milan thinks about fashion. I think about opera and definitely about soccer. But it is true that Milan is also one top destination for its art and architecture. And recently, it has become more of a tourist attraction. It is the second largest city of Italy. And uh, here you have, uh, on this picture, you have uh, the two iconic sites in the city of Milan. On the left-hand side, the Triumphal Arch, which is the entrance uh, to the Galleria. And to the right hand side, the famous cathedral of Milan, the Duomo. Actually, it is with the Duomo that I'm going to start telling you something about Milan. The Duomo is the very symbol of this city and one of the largest churches in Italy. Uh, its beauty is incredible. Uh, there are so many architectural elements. Uh, imagine that there are about 3,400 statues that decorate the Duomo. And the most important of all the statues uh, is the one that is located to the top spire of the Duomo, and it is the little Virgin Mary, the Madonnina has the Milanese call it. It is the symbol of the city, the protector of the city. And one of the amazing things is that during your free time, you can decide to climb up to the terraces of the Duomo. And from there, you can, you can really enjoy the most amazing landscape. You can see through the city of Milan, and in the distance, you can see the Alps. So you really get a sense of the beautiful location Milan is set in. And look at this picture. 
This is the beautiful Galleria. It is dedicated to our first king, King Victor Emmanuel II. And in Milan, it is nicknamed the drawing room of the city, the best living room. As if you were, you were in a large, beautiful aristocratic palace, this is the place where you want to come. It's full of shops. It is, uh, there are cafes, restaurants. Uh, imagine that one of the oldest establishments in this Galleria is the Prada shop that was opened in 1950. It was back then a small family business. The owner uh, thought that the business, the business would be continued by his son, but in reality, the real fame of this brand came from the female members of the family who launched it as what it is nowadays, one of the best labels in the world. But in the Galleria, you can also go to the famous Camparino Cafe and you can enjoy an aperitivo. Because you know, when we talk about aperitivo, we're talking of all of, uh, of the most Milanese of all things. Uh, the aperitivo is uh, something that everybody does in Milan. It's like a small luxury that is affordable for everyone. In 1862, Mr. Mr. Gaspare Campari, who was the owner of the popular cafe in Milan, launched a new bitter aperitif that we simply named uh, bitter. And uh, that was the beginning of everything. Nowadays, uh, everybody sits before dinner for some snacks and a drink. And we talk about the day, we spend some time together. And this fashion traveled quickly across the entire country. And it's one of the characteristics of our days. Mm, yeah, these aperitivo look so good, but it's a bit too early here in Boston to have one of these. Um, but now, aside from the impressive architecture and the awesome shopping and uh, enjoying one of these uh, drinks, many people visit Milan for its world famous art. Linda, what fam famous paintings are we going to see? Well, Milan is full of museums, but definitely somebody coming to the city for the first time should take some time to visit this place. It's the refectory of an old convent, a complex called Santa Maria delle Grazie, and this amazing fresco was painted around 1495 by Leonardo da Vinci in person, a masterpiece of Italian Renaissance art. Uh, its location, unfortunately, did not preserve the fresco very well, and that's the reason why, if you're planning to visit it, you need to secure a space, because it works only on reservations, since only a limited amount of, uh, of uh, people can visit it through the day, and that's why on some of our tours, we offer it as an optional tour. On others, where it's not offered, it is important that you go on the website and secure a reservation so that you can see this masterpiece of art. Even if this is the only thing you do in Milan, it will really make you feel like you have seen so much of the city and definitely must one of the most significant things of Italian art. Hmm. Thank you so much for walking us through that, especially um, I just want to reiterate to our audience at home, if you're going to Italy and uh, the Last Supper is one of the things you want to see. Make those reservations ahead of time, as Linda just mentioned. Now, let's move on and continue our journey to our number two spot on the list here, which is Lake Como. Yes, our second destination to go to is Lake Como region. Lake Como, Como is a name that, that actually comes very many times. Como is the name of a city, is the name of a province, and it's the name of this lake. This is the deepest of all the Italian lakes and the third largest in the country. And it really is a tourist destination since uh, a number of centuries. Uh, since the ancient times, this destination wanted to be seen. Virgil had a villa on Lake Como and George Clooney has a villa nowadays on Lake Como. So visitors from all around the world come and enjoy this view, exactly what you see on this picture, this dramatic mountains and the waters of the lake, the beautiful flowers, the gardens of Lake Como and the beautiful architecture 
architecture of its aristocratic villas. This is what always fascinates the, the visitors from all around the world. The best way to enjoy Lake Como is definitely on a boat ride. The boat is the way you can really see the shore, you can see the villages in the distance, you can admire the villas, you cannot get too close to them, but you can live the dream by traveling on a boat on the waters of Lake Como. One of the peculiarities about Lake Como is the shape. It is an upside down letter Y, and it is divided into two branches. At the junction of these two branches, there is the Lajo that you see in the picture right now. Worldwide famous, he really is considered the true pearl of the lake. Well, Bellagio is a place where you can admire uh, the beautiful villas uh, overlooking the water, like Villa Serbelloni, for example, but you can also get a sense of how charming are the Italian villages. Uh, you can take a walk, you can uh, browse uh, the many shops, the boutiques, uh, you can sit down at one of the many restaurants. You know, Lake Como is also a foodie destination, like everywhere in Italy, I know. But there are things that you can only have on this lake. For example, a risotto with perch or with misoltini. Misoltini is a dried fish that they use for the risotto that can only be found in this place in Italy. Mm. All right, I have to try that next time I'm going to Bellagio or Como. Definitely. So uh, let's continue our journey to this beautiful city of Venice, which is certainly Italy's top travel destination. It is located in northeastern Italy and known for its beautiful bridges and scenic canals. Linda, can you tell our audience a bit more about this the beautiful landmarks one will see during a stay and visit. And if you could also touch on a few popular things we should do while we're there, that would be great. Absolutely. Venice is a must-see destination in the world. Anybody in the world should visit it at least once in their lifetime. It is built on the Venetian, in the Venetian Lagoon. It is a masterpiece of Mother Nature because of its location and, and of mankind because of what they were able to do exactly there, building something that looks like a floating city. Well, think of the lagoon. The Venetian Lagoon dates back to 6,000 years ago. Uh, it is like a platform in the Adriatic Sea that hardened for centuries and centuries under the sun and then got invaded by water. And exactly in that location, they built the city of, uh, of Venice. Now, the city is not exactly floating. It is actually built on, in a fascinating way, a sort of upside down forest. So there are many trees that were used almost like nails that are inserted into the seabed and that is the stage on which the city is sitting nowadays. The best way to see the city of Venice is on one of the gondolas, the one uh, boat that has been around for centuries and centuries. And then from the gondola, you can see the beautiful architecture like this one, the Doge's Palace, the center of the Venetian power, the Venetian commercial fame around the ancient world. Venice was a powerful maritime republic and this palace represents all of this incredible history of the city. You have to see this place, you have to walk by, to walk by, especially if you want to see the Bridge of Sides, because it is the one connecting the palace to the prison. And then, of course, you have to go into St. Mark's Square, the only real piazza of the city of Venice. None of the other open spaces are called piazza, only this one is. Uh, it is the symbol of Venice. It is also so the lowest place, it is 590 feet long. It is home to the bell tower and to the beautiful St. Mark Basilica. 
And in the next picture, we're going to show you exactly St. Mark Basilica, a forest of columns and architectural elements. Imagine there are four, more than 400 architectural elements to decorate this incredible basilica. The interior is a triumph of gold. It was consecrated in 1094, and it can really be said that it's a unique place on earth. Mm. Well, Venice is a place that can be enjoyed uh, from the water. So, for example, going on the gondola, but it can be also, it, it is also worth walking around. Uh, now, if you're coming to Venice, uh, one recommendation is to have good walking shoes, uh, because look at those bridges. You will be going up and down bridges all the time in Venice. Uh, now, don't worry, it is something that you will do with joy because anytime you come off one of those bridges, what opens up before your eyes is incredible scenery. It is a hidden corner. It's a very picturesque corner of the city of Venice. The, the city of Venice has about 446 bridges and they all open up to the unexpected. And if you get too tired, you could do something very simple. In the next little square, you sit down and you enjoy the most Venetian of all the drinks, the famous spritz. I know that nowadays the spritz is basically found everywhere. I would say everywhere in the world, but it, it originated here in Venice. And it is a little weird to call it cocktail because really in the beginning, this was just a mix, a way to mix wine with water, specifically fizzy water. Aperol and Campari came later. And that is uh, what we drink nowadays. So you can have it orange color or red, but you definitely can have it all throughout the day. And it's the most inexpensive drink in the city of Venice. Wow, wonderful. Um, Linda, let me stop you for a second. Uh, we just got a question from Mari and she is wondering how easy or difficult is it for people in wheelchairs to get around Venice? Well, I won't lie, it, is not, it, it can be challenging, but it can mm -hmm. be done. Of course, you might not get to every single corner of the city, but you will be able to get to the main locations uh, and you won't be disappointed at all. Okay, thank you so much for answering that. Let's continue our journey and get a little bit more off the be beaten path. Let's get out of the city and let's go into the Ligurian uh, countryside. Linda, tell our audience where they should get a go while in Liguria. Well, if you are in Liguria, you want to visit uh, the most beautiful place of all, which is Cinque Terre. It is uh, one of the be be most beautiful places on earth. It is located in Liguria, overlooking the Ligurian Sea. Uh, it is like a pearl. It's beautiful, but it is fragile. It needs to be preserved, to be respected, and in order to keep enjoying it. But it is a place that you cannot miss visiting. Five lands or five villages. They can be visited by boat or by train. You can hike the many trails. You will not be disappointed by any of the moments you will spend in the Cinque Terre. And you will realize that these five villages all have a distinct flavor. This one, for example, is Rio Maggiore the most every day of all the villages. This is where you can visit churches, vineyards, get a good sense of what a little Italian village looks like. And uh, for example, you can also enjoy a lot uh, in the next village, which is Manarola, a pretty mix of vineyards, of shops, of houses. And look at those houses, how beautifully they hug the side of the cliff. And then, of course, you can go on and visit my favorite one of all the villages, Corniglia. Corniglia is the only one of the five that does not sit on the water. The weather here might be a touch cooler because of its elevation uh, on the top of the cliff. And the area is super well known for good, I would say, excellent wine. 
And then comes Monte Rosso, which is probably the most appreciated wine by tourists because it is the one where you can enjoy a good day at the beach. You can take a lovely swim. You can sunbathe. You can also stay during the evening where you have quite a nightlife around there and availability uh, of hotels around Monte Rosso. And then last, but not least is the beautiful Vernazza with its dramatic views, with a lively waterfront, with a castle at the top of the hill. Here is the place where you would probably stop at lunchtime. You can sit down at one of the tiny restaurants and while looking at life go by, you can enjoy some of the Ligurian specialties. Above all, for example, since you're close to the city of Genoa, this is a good opportunity to try one of the most famous Italian specialties, uh, pesto, pasta al pesto. Once you have tried this one, then you'll know that there is no better version in the world than the Genoese pesto. Mm -hmm. I totally have to agree with you, uh, Linda. I love pesto and the best pastel pesto I've ever tried was in Liguria. And fun fact, actually, for our audience, I've had this pasta after I had four out of the five towns uh, we just talked about. So it tasted extra good after a long day of hiking. Now, we do have to leave this beautiful area of Cinque Terre and continue our journey south to another gorgeous, gorgeous region, the region of Tuscany. Now, there is so much to explore and see and taste here in Tuscany. The countryside is just beautiful with its rolling hills and vineyards and olive groves and all these cute little towns and, of course, uh, many cities filled with art and history. Linda, can you tell our audience what they shouldn't miss when visiting Tuscany? Well, Tuscany is a wealth of historic treasures, uh, considered one of a kind in the entire world. Uh, picturesque villages, beautiful countryside, amazing cultural heritage. Everything we have in Tuscany is just extraordinary from the cities to the rolling hills. For example, Chianti and Val d'Orcia are the uh, landscapes, uh, the wine landscapes of Italy that have been protected by UNESCO. Uh, you must experience this. If you come to Tuscany, you really need to have the time to go see one of the vineyards and maybe visit a winery and definitely enjoy here a good glass of Chianti wine, which is so famous around the world, but it does taste different if you are right here and uh, you enjoy this wonderful wine. But Tuscany is not only countryside. Tuscany is also some lovely smaller towns, uh, but filled with incredible treasury. For example, this one is Siena. Siena is like uh, Italy's loveliest uh, medieval city. And uh, it's definitely a trip worth making when you are in Tuscany. Uh, the, the heart of Siena is its central square and the masterpiece is the famous cathedral. Look at it. It is in this picture with its variety of colored marbles. It really gives you a sense of how incredible were the things that were done throughout the centuries and that we are able to appreciate still to this day. But after Siena, you definitely want to visit another very famous destination, which is called San Gimignano, a medieval masterpiece uh, with a unique skyline. Uh, it was nicknamed the Manhattan of the Middle Ages because of its towers, its tower houses, uh, the ones that are still preserved. San Gimignano is also a place where you want to make a very tasty stop. You want to stop in the main square and you, and you want to try gelato. Now I know that gelato is commonly found everywhere and fresh every day all over Italy, but Gelateria Dondoli in San Gimignano has won so many prizes that I think they cannot count them anymore. In this place, they make everything. They even have their own cows for the production of the milk that they use every day for their fresh gelato for the many, many visitors that come to see them. Mm, 
Linda, I'm getting hungry over here. I have to agree, the best gelato I've ever had was in San Gimignano. And when I stayed in Tuscany, I went back to San Gimignano every day and I even had the, uh, the gelato for breakfast. Now, I did get a quick um, message here from uh, Paula, who is, um, I believe, going on the Tuscany food and wine tour in just four days. Um, I believe you're doing that too, all right? Um, what, what, what weather can she expect in Tuscany right now? Well, I hope wonderful weather. And if we're lucky, the way we have been so far, we have had the most gorgeous uh, uh, days. Uh, we did have a little rain in the last two days, and I hope uh, we will be done soon with that rain. But don't worry, because the landscape will not be disappointing in whatever weather, I promise mm -hmm. you. Okay, and what is the name of the gelateria called again? A few Dondoli. people are asking. Dondoli. 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 Okay, great. We'll put it in a chat in just a mo moment so people um, can see what it's spelled. But let's continue our journey because Tus Tuscany is full of treasures. Let's move on and talk a little bit about the cities. Pisa. Exactly, the city of Pisa. Everybody comes here and everybody takes the same picture. They want to hold the leaning tower and making sure and make sure that the tower never falls. We also have a very uh, famous Italian song that we sing to all the kids that uh, the hope is that the leaning tower of Pisa never comes down and it will never be because in reality, we found the way to make sure that the tower stopped leaning any further. But this is an absolute masterpiece of architecture. In reality, the leaning is, is given by the uh, softness of the the terrain, which was unexpected at the time of construction. But you know, uh, Italian engineers and architects found a solution and this place can still be admired by millions of people every year. Uh, Pisa is also a very lively cultural center because it has uh, one of the best Italian universities. So it's not simply a touristy destination, but it's also a place where you can enjoy meeting a very international crowd. And then of course, the city of Florence. Uh, it is hard to use just a few words to describe the city of Florence. Uh, Mark Twain once said that this was a city of dreams and definitely was right because there is such an abundance of timeless art, of rustic Tuscan cuisine, of incredible boutique shopping and mesmerizing views at every turn. And of course, let's have a look at some of the architecture that you will be enjoying. For example, the architectural masterpieces of Florence. Look at the dome of the cathedral. The dome made by Brunelleschi is definitely a masterpiece of early Renaissance and together with the Giotto's Bell Tower, it is a symbol of the city of Florence, but also Ponte Vecchio, for example, which gives you a sense of what Florence must have looked like in the Middle Ages. Uh, it really is uh, a quaint location where you can sit down and just see the Arno River go by. And then definitely Piazza della Signoria, which is the center of uh, the politics of Florence, the center of the power. But it is also a place that should be called an open air museum because it is decorated with statues, but not just statues, uh, masterpieces of Italian Renaissance. Consider that you're next door to the Uffizi Gallery, but you could simply sit in the square and admire some of the most amazing art that this country is known for. Speaking of art, Linda, we had a question uh, pre-submitted by Pam and she wanted to know if there's an oppor opportunity to see the statue of David on our tours. Well, definitely some of our tours offer as an optional excursion a visit to the Academia Museum, which is where the original statue of David is housed. Um, but for those tours uh, who do not have that optional tour, you can definitely talk to your tour director and make sure that you discuss a good time to make a reservation so that you don't miss out from anything, of, anything else of your tour, but you get to see the masterpieces of Florentine art. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. All right, let's leave the beautiful city of Florence and Tuscany and make our way to Rome, Italy's capital 
and the eternal city. Linda, tell us more about what people can expect to see here. Well, and then comes Rome, the eternal beauty. Uh, it is uh, the beginning or the final destination of any journey to Italy. It is home of history, definitely. It is a place where you can come back as many times as you want during the course of your life and you still get the feeling that you have something more left to see. Uh, there is so much. Definitely, it is the place where you come the first time to admire the vestiges of the ancient empire. And above all of them, you have the Colosseum, of course, the largest amphitheater that the Romans built. This incredible example of Roman engineering that still exists after over 2000 years. It is amazing and on our tours we go inside so that you can really admire and get a sense of what this place was in the ancient times and how it came all the way to us nowadays. Mm -hmm. But the Colosseum is not the only place you will see of the ancient Roman Empire. You will also see the famous Roman Forum, the very center of what Rome was and what Rome meant to the entire world. I mean, imagine that this place is where the city has been, was founded in 753 before Christ. I mean, just saying the date, it's mind blowing. You know, last 21st of April, we celebrated birthday number 2,774. That's how long these ruins have been here. This ar amazing architecture has been here. All across the city, you will find the vestiges of the ancient empire. For example, unexpected, in the middle of the modern city, in the very heart of the Renaissance city, here comes the best preserved of all the Roman temples, the Pantheon. This place is incredible. Still to this day, it's hard to imagine how they could, back in the second century after Christ, build the largest dome with unreinforced concrete that is still in existence in the world. Uh, you enter inside because it is possible to enter and you will be just lost in the beauty and the mystery of this construction. And then of course Rome is uh, much more. Rome is uh, the lovely piazzas uh, and the monumental fountains. And there is no more monumental fountain than this one, the Trevi fountain, where you want to make sure you go because you have to toss that, co that coin. You have to make sure that that coin will ensure you to come back to the eternal city as many times as possible. And nearby the Trevi Fountain, you definitely want to go see the Spanish Steps, which is an amazing location. The Spanish Steps is the center of elegance, the center of la dolce vita. There is no one like the Romans who know how to live their life. Uh, you can be here and just do some people watching or sit on the steps. A couple of weeks ago, I was there and someone proposed to his wife-to-be, and it was quite a moment, I think, internationally featured on every Facebook play page <laughs> on the planet, but it was quite amazing. You can climb to the top of the staircase at sunset and enjoy the sun setting over the skyline of Rome. And then last but not least, definitely the center of Christianity. Uh, here we are in St. Peter's Square. This picture was taken from the top of the dome and it really feels like this square is embracing the city of Rome, is embracing the Christians coming to the very center of Christianity. Nowadays, the Vatican is an independent state. And another fascinating feature about Rome is that you get two countries with just one visit. Mm. We certainly love that, checking off another country, right? And as you said, there is so much to see here in Rome and we could be spending all day talking about it and you could go back and back and not have seen it all. But it is time for our journey to continue. Um, and we are going um, 
to continue to uh, the Campania region next uh, to our number seven place to visit, which is Naples. Yeah. Linda, uh, why would we not want to miss going there? And are there any specific foods one should try while in Naples? Well, Daniela, now you're just speaking to my heart. My heart is exactly there in the city of Naples in the region called Campania because that's where I'm originally from. Naples is a city like no other. It's a city that really has a heart, a big heart. Um, it is beautiful, it is chaotic, it is lively, it is passionate, authentic, and at times surreal but it is a place that you definitely should not be missing visiting. Look at this, the scenery before your eyes when you arrive in Naples, the beautiful Bay of Naples, one of the most beautiful all over Italy with Mount Vesuvius in the backdrop and this incredible number of buildings. And then you get into the narrow alleys and you can really discover the beauty of Naples, which is a, a beauty that has never changed in time in a way. This is a city that doesn't want to surrender to modernity and it doesn't want to become touristy in a very strict sense. It is a city that welcomes people to discover our traditions. You need to come and do things as we do. Uh, even the food is a good representation of our culture, simple yet very tasty, passionate, uh, like the pizza. There is no other place in the world where pizza can be called pizza, but in Naples. I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anyone, but even UNESCO decided to protect the pizza as an intangible heritage. And it really is. Imagine this idea came because uh, it wanted to celebrate the visit of a queen, Queen Margarita, to the city of Naples. A local chef had the idea to top a focaccia bread with these three ingredients, the tomatoes, the mozzarella, and the basil. And all together, they make the colors of the Italian flag. Ah, this looks so delicious. Um... But let's switch gears a little bit um, and talk about another fascinating side trip that I rec would recommend to anyone going to Naples. Linda, what famous site is located near Naples that one should visit? If you go to Naples, you really are very close uh, to a wonderful destination, one place that everybody dreams about visiting, has definitely heard of, uh, and once they go there are never disappointed. And that is uh, the ancient city of Pompeii. Pompeii, the place that was buried by Mount Vesuvius in the eruption of 79 after Christ. It is a place that became frozen in time. So imagine you enter through the modern gates of the archeological site and all of a sudden it's like you jump into the page of a history book. You can see how the Romans lived. You can live, you can live their daily life, the moments before the eruption. They have, you, you can see where they ate. You can see the spa. You can see the temples, the main square where they gathered, the market where they actually shopped for food. It is still incredible to say a living place that they will leave you with incredible memories. Wow, really stunning. Well, let's continue our journey further south to the beautiful region of Amalfi and Sorrento. What can we expect here, Linda? We can expect nothing more than beauty and more beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. The Sorrento Peninsula and the Amalfi Coast uh, are definitely the most beautiful diamonds uh, on the crown of this region, of Campania region. Sorrento is, uh, with its quaintness, uh, with its beauty, with the scent in the air, in the air, in the air, you actually feel 
the flavor of lemons because of the many orchards that you see all around. And the scenery is so beautiful. These towns are built and are uh, sometimes built on the top of these dramatic cliffs into the Mediterranean Sea. And the wonderful colors, the pale colors of the arbor with the fishermen houses, with the fishermen boats, everything seems to have been crafted to really uh, somehow how please the soul, please the eyes and the soul of the visitors. Uh, it is a wonderful place. Uh, and if you visit it in combination with this other location, the Amalfi Coast, uh, then you will not be disappointed. The Amalfi Coast uh, is a UNESCO world site, is the classic Mediterranean landscape, uh, a sensual blend of both natural and cultural wonders. Uh, the city, the town of Amalfi, with its beautiful cathedral with its uh, wonderful uh, harbor and the landscape surrounding it and definitely the little picturesque town of Positano, a dream for many visitors, uh, a place where everybody wants to go to enjoy the real beauty, the essence of the Mediterranean. And besides these two destinations on the Amalfi Coast, there are trails, uh, fantastic hiking uh, adventures uh, like the Path of the Gods, for example. And there is a reason why it's called the path of the gods, because when you are there, you really are as close as possible to the gods. And definitely the food and the drinks. Well, I already mentioned uh, the lemons. So when you are around Sorrento and Amalfi, you definitely have to try our most well-known products. Uh, the limoncello, which is made only with the lemons of this area, and the lemon delice. Uh, this cake was invented by a chef in Sorrento, and it was made famous uh, by another chef uh, on the Amalfi coast. Uh, these two products are the best representation of the coastline, the beauty of that color and the wonderful flavor of those lemons. Mm, so beautiful. I visited the Amalfi Coast um, a few years ago and loved every second of it. Next, we're going to talk about a region I actually haven't visited yet, but it's on my bucket list. And I saw a few comments from the audience. It's on their bucket list um, as well. So number nine on our list is Puglia. Linda, um, at Go Ahead, we've been offering Puglia for quite a while now, but overall, I would say it's still fairly undiscovered. Let's talk about why Puglia made our list today and what travelers can expect to see, experience, and eat, of course. And I just want to infuse a question that we just got from Yvonne here as well. She just wants to have some suggestions for her trip. She's leaving for Puglia soon, so if you can just um, infuse a few suggestions here, that would be great. Absolutely. Puglia, you're right, is a fairly unexplored place in Italy, or at least it is fairly untouched by mass tourism. It is the heel of the boot and a land of sea, hills and endless plains. It attracts visitors because of its amazing coastline and because also of its beautiful cities and picturesque historical villages. Imagine that the coastline of Puglia is about 800 kilometers across both the Adriatic and the Ionian Sea. But besides the coastline in Puglia, you have this amazingly picturesque historical villages, like for example, Albero Bello. This is not just a village, this is a fairy tale place. You arrive in Albero Bello and it is surreal. It feels like you have jumped into a fairy tale book and all of a sudden you're waiting for one of your favorite characters to show from around the corner. These dwellings were home to farmers once, but nowadays they house restaurants, shops, even hotels. Well, this is a place 
place that definitely should not be missed when visiting Puglia. And you know, when you are in Puglia, uh, you have an incredible cuisine uh, full of uh, uh, flavors and wonderful fresh products. We had to choose just one. So we chose the Orecchiette pasta. Puglia is the home of great, great bread making and pasta making. When you walk around the villages and the cities, uh, you can see women making the orecchiette because really it is the most iconic pasta uh, to be found in Puglia with different condiments, uh, but always the same shape. And then of course in Puglia, we have also the larger cities, like for example, the capital of the, of the region, which is the city of Bari. For the Italians, this has always been the gateway to the East, the place that has, uh, carries with it uh, that mix of cultures east and west it is home of santa claus you know it is the place where you actually find the resting place of saint nicholas santa claus you can see the tall bell tower of the church dedicated to this important saint so bari is definitely worth a visit and then traveling all the way south almost to the very tip of italy on the eastern coast you will find the city of lecce Lecce is nicknamed in Italy the Florence of the South because of its architectural beauty. In this picture, we have the ancient Roman amphitheater. The rest of the city is a jewel of Baroque architecture. Beautiful. Ah, I really want to travel to Puglia now. Now, we're almost at the end of our virtual journey today, but there is one more place we want to talk about our number 10 place to visit. And that takes us all the way to the largest island in the Mediterranean, to Sicily. Linda, can I ask you one last time to tell our audience why they should visit Sicily? Well, someone very famous once said that if you don't see Sicily, then you don't see the essence of Italy, because that's exactly what Sicily is, the true essence of this country and of Italian culture. Uh, a trip to Sicily should always start in Palermo, the capital, a city of a thousand faces, loud but elegant at the same time, eclectic, never dull. Uh, Palermo and its architectural beauty, uh, its traditions, the people who live there attract and enchant thousands of visitors every day. Incredible is to find out uh, how amazing the architecture, how royal the architecture of Palermo is. This, for example, is the cathedral. Palermo has some of the most important architectural styles that are a testimony to the many colonizations that came through Sicily and left a mark on this culture. And if you want to continue your journey through Sicily and explore a bit more about the ancient culture of the island, you definitely want a good travel towards the east to the city of Siracusa. Siracusa once was uh, more powerful than Athens uh, in the ancient world. This was a Greek colony, the home of Archimedes. Uh, and that's the place where you come nowadays uh, to discover some amazingly preserved uh, Greek ruins, as well as a very beautiful historical center located on an island. And then finally, you want to see the Pearl of the Mediterranean, the town of Taormina, perched on the top of a cliff overlooking a glorious coastline and the Ionian Sea, and in the distance, Mount Etna, the largest of, of all volcanoes in Europe. You know, when you are in Taormina and you are in one specific location in Taormina at the Greek Roman theater, you really get a sense of what Sicily is. Amazingly beautiful on the historical point of view. Amazingly beautiful because of its landscape and amazingly mysterious because of what mother nature is able to give us still to this day. Like the eruption, the spe spectacular eruptions of Mount Etna that if you're lucky, you can see from your safe locations or location of Taormina. 
And then of course, the food. I mean, how could I just uh, recommend one, two or three dishes uh, of uh, the Sicilian cuisine? Sicilian cuisine is everything and more of what you imagine it is. So I just decided to start with the one thing that I like to have in the morning when I am in, the, in Sicily, the Sicilian breakfast, which is a granita with brioche. The brioche is a, a light, uh, lightly sweetened bun and the granita is made uh, with fresh ingredients. Uh, my favorite is the lemon one and the almond one. Mm. Wonderful. Linda, thank you so much for sharing your top 10 places to visit in Italy with us today. I certainly want to go to all 10 of them now and I'm sure our audience at home uh, just added a few uh, destinations to their bucket list as well. Now, before we get into our question and answer session, let's talk about how you at home can see all of these significant places on Edtrip with EF Go Ahead Tour. Well, with EF Go Ahead Tour, the magnificent thing about EF Go Ahead Tour is that we have uh, all kinds of tours to suit every taste. Uh, we have uh, the tours that cover all of the country. Uh, one for all, for example, is Journey to Italy. The real reason why I like this tour is because uh, it is a great tour for both uh, uh, new travelers, uh, first time visitors to Italy and repeating visitors to Italy. Why is that? Because if you have already been to this country, you most probably have done the highlights like Venice, Florence and Rome. But this tour offers also some of the beaten path locations. So you really can get a great sense from the very north to the very south uh, of what is the true essence of this, the true essence of this country. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And for the more adventurous type, the people that want to stay off the beaten path, um, what type of tours would you recommend there? The walking tours, for sure. And for example, walking through Tuscany is a great, uh, a great tour. Tuscany walking tour takes you to villages, to towns, to the countryside. It is the best way to explore one of the most famous regions in the world. You, you hike and then you indulge in that beautiful Italian style, Dolce Vita style. Mm, yes. And if you're a food lover like me, you definitely need to try one of our uh, food and wine tours. Uh, Linda, tell us a little bit more about what it's like to be on a food and wine tour and what our audience can expect there. Well, a food and wine tour is uh, definitely a wonderful, marvelous experience. For example, this one that is coming up uh, very soon is Campania, Puglia and the Amalfi Coast. Uh, a wonderful way to get closer to the culture of the place. Uh, you know, it's like uh, when you know a person, how do you know that person well enough when you have been to their home? Well, this is like stepping into someone's home. The experiences you will be doing are the most authentic. So you really get a sense of the place uh, uh, and a, a taste of the place at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I understand you just got back from a very special food and wine tour. Which one was that? I just finished uh, the food and wine tour of Piedmont, Piedmont in Tuscany with America's Test Kitchen. And I have to say that that was a lifetime experience. I'm telling you, Daniela, I felt almost uh, as blessed as the travelers were uh, because of the things we did, the experiences we did. It was an amazing program. I truly. What was one highlight? Of the tour, my just highlight. one. Okay, my highlight was the truffle hunt. Mm. We found two truffles, nice. a dog and a truffle hunter, and just spending time with him and asking him questions and him sharing his family stories. It was amazing. It was something that as an Italian who has been to those places thousands of times, I felt like I discovered so much more on this experience. Wonderful. Great. And then we have a specific portfolio for those of you at home that want to get out there, but maybe don't want to plan travel around others, uh, but want to be in the company of uh, people. So we have just the right tours for you as well, but because with Go Ahead, you can travel solo, but you're never traveling alone. 
Linda, we've got a lot of questions um, I, before the session and throughout the session today about what it's like to travel on our solo tours to Italy. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience? Well, the solo tours are a wonderful opportunity. You just said it right. You want to go to places, but you don't want to go alone, but you still want to have your privacy, your moments. And the solo tours have been crafted to really suit that kind of expectation. You will be with a group of people. Maybe you will make friends for a lifetime and you will see see the places in a very intimate kind of, uh, of situation. Uh, I think these are a great opportunity and the fact that we have crafted some specific tours uh, just for solo travelers uh, really highlights the uniqueness of these experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, and I just want to be clear to our solo community out there, while we have these unique itineraries that are just crafted for our solo audience, you are more than welcome to join any of our Italy tours. We have more than 40 uh, tours to Italy or even any of our other 190 plus itineraries. So solo uh, travelers are welcome our, on our standard tours as well as our um, specifically crafted solo tours. Linda, thank you so, so much um, for, again, sharing your top 10 destinations with us today and for walking us through some of our um, itineraries today. Now, we want to get into our qu question and answer session now. And before we take some more live questions from the audience, I do want to ask a question that we've um, seen a lot of times prior to the session, but also throughout the session today. Um, what is the best time to, uh, to visit Italy? Is there a good time to go? Okay, you will not, please take my word seriously. Italy is a place for 12 months a year, definitely. You can go to the big cities off season. You can go to the countryside and to the coast when it's uh, uh, springtime or late summer and the fall season. Italy is really a place where you can enjoy the most beautiful vacation any time of the year. Mm -hmm. Good, that's great to know. Now, more specifically, we have a question here from Mary. She's going to Puglia at the beginning of April. April, what will the temperature be like in April? Well, April is a very uh, nice month. Uh, um, you might have some days, uh, it is the typical month where uh, you have uh, chilly in the morning and it gets quite hot during the day. So it is one of those moments of the year when you want to dress in layers. You want to really pack according to this rule, dress in layers. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then there's one more question here from Pamela. She wanted to know what time of the year does Venice usually get flooded? Well, it is during the rainy season, but I can tell you just this morning, there was an alert of a flood, but the mose, which is the structure that was built, worked per perfectly well. And the only water they saw was just some water at St. Mark Square, which is the lowest point of the, of, uh, the city, but the rest of the city was okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a question here from Gail uh, regarding our solo tours. And um, for a single that goes on one of the tours, do you dine as a group or do you dine on your own? No, we dine as a group. Uh, mm -hmm. the, one, the one specific feature of, uh, of uh, every tour is that of the group dynamic, which is something that we build and uh, foster with attention and care. So it will be a pleasure for you to dine with the rest of your fellow travelers. All right, perfect. And then lots of questions about the weather today. Karen wants to know the, the temperature in Puglia in October. The temperature, the temperature in Puya in October is uh, very nice, milder, although some days can be can feel as hot as summer. It is uh, a region of Italy that can experience very long summers. Mm -hmm. And what is the best time to see the Trevi Fountain when there's very few visitors? I actually want to quickly chime in with this one. I when Last time I went to Rome, I got up early to go for a little jog, and there was no one at the Trevi Fountain. So early mornings, but Linda, what's your advice? Yeah, I always say early mornings or the mid middle of the night, and you mm -hmm. get that picture that everybody will think has been, has been taken <laughs> for a documentary. <laughs> 
Um, all right, and then let's let's take one more, uh, two more questions. Also, Linda is asking about entry requirements to visiting Italy. Now, Linda, it depends on when you're traveling. I'm going to talk qu quickly about the current entry requirements, but please know that they're always, always changing. I've seen them change week over week. So currently, in order to enter Italy, go ahead requires, and Italy requires that um, uh, travelers are fully vaccinated. So that means that, um, you know, 14 days have lapsed since you've gotten either the last shot of your two doses or just the one dose. And then uh, you currently also need to get a, um, COVID test that needs to be taken within 72 hours prior to your arrival in Italy. And there is something called a passenger locator form that you need to complete in order to travel to Italy. And then, of course, there's the standard entry requirements, such as your passport and, and, and so on, right? But li like I said, these requirements are always changing. So we, ha we have entry requirements listed on our website. Feel free to check those out or just uh, check the local government websites there as well. But please also know it's all worth it filling out that ec uh, extra form or getting that test. Once you get to Italy, it's really worth um, doing these few extra uh, things that travel requires um, of you today. Um, all right, let me see. Um, I think this is all we, uh, we have time for today in terms of questions. Um, so let me just bring up the presentation one last time here. And if you uh, enjoyed yourself today, like Linda and I did, please mark your calendars for our upcoming travel talks. Um, as you can see here, we have lots of travel talks coming up. We are going to talk about Greece, the UK, and Peru over the next few weeks. And in December, we are counting down to the holidays with some very special travel talks. Um, we hope to see you again soon at one of these webinars or maybe all of them. So if you want to sign up, just go to our website at goaheadtours.com slash webinars. So thank you so much to our audience at home for being here with us today. We really hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, also know that you will be receiving an email from us in the coming days with more tips about Italy. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you again, Linda, so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule now that you're back to traveling. Um, and, and for being here with us today and sh sharing your incredible tips about Italy. Do you have any parting words for our audience today? Well, definitely. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Daniela, for having me here today. Now, what I have to say, I really look forward to, to seeing all of you to Italy to, on one of our tours uh, and to enjoy a great time together. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone at home. Thank you for joining us today and we really hope to see you on the road in Italy or somewhere in the world soon. Um, join one of our travel talks in the future until you get to travel again and thank you for tuning in. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Grazie mille. Grazie.